Hi, this is Gary Chartier from the Center for a Stateless Society. Welcome to ATP 101, An Introduction to Anarchism. This is Lecture 7. There's a pretty constant worry on the part of people who haven't thought much about the way a stateless society might operate about national defense under anarchy. And the question here is, who would do for us what the military supposedly does now? Uh, interesting question, obviously, what the military exactly does for us now. But uh, there are several considerations that are relevant here. So one is that in a stateless society, obviously, there would be no nations to defend. National boundaries are artificial, they're arbitrary, uh, and clearly uh, they wouldn't continue to obtain in a stateless society. So the whole notion of foreign aggression in a stateless society is really kind of a nonsense notion. It doesn't really make any sense. The basic principles of cooperative defense against aggression, what we talked about in Lecture 6, uh, with respect to defense agencies uh, wouldn't differ really whether those engaging in aggression in my hometown of Riverside uh, came from Los Angeles or from New York or from Sri Lanka, right? I mean, the difference is really just one of scale. All of the considerations that I talked about in Lecture 6 would certainly be relevant if the issue were just a, a foreign invasion by a defense agency, an, a, an invasion by a rogue defense agency from someplace else that was on a marauding mission, uh, had, uh, had gone uh, uh, into, the, uh, into the criminal world, had gone over to the dark side. But, uh, so I don't think there's anything especially interesting or out of the ordinary to say uh, about foreign aggression to the extent that we're just talking about bad behavior by defense agencies. Uh, we've already talked about uh, those issues and I think they're, they're still uh, very much relevant here. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to, to see that a defense agency that operated in the ordinary manner, funded by uh, clients or if it were cooperative by its members or by donors, uh, probably wouldn't get a lot of support for engaging in marauding missions around the world, far away from uh, the people it was primarily designed to serve. But what the Tannehills actually seem to have in mind here is a situation in which a stateless society is attacked by a state, a state with tax money, a conscript army, and imperial ambitions. Right? I think this is really what's going on. That is, they imagine a situation in which some societies have gone stateless, but others have not, and those that have not ask themselves, hmm, might it make sense for us to conquer these uh, uh, stateless uh, societies and incorporate them into our imperial territory? So uh, that's certainly worth, worth thinking about. Now, obviously, this is a fairly specialized case. It's not the uh, exclusive or primary situation in which we often think about need for defense against foreign violence. So national governments often provoke violence. I think it's pretty clear that this is a pretty predictable feature of life in today's world. And when they do, their people, that is the people over whom they claim authority, uh, may be targeted. So people oppressed by uh, uh, violence may opt for terrorism, for instance. And uh, this is a pretty, uh, a pretty familiar story in, uh, uh, in the modern world at any rate, uh, terrorists, uh, often are people who are responding uh, to violence by national governments. They can't mount full-scale military assaults on those governments, and so unjustifiably uh, they attack non-combatants uh, who are subject to the authority of those governments in an attempt to pressure those governments. Any targeting of non-combatants is unjust, uh, but I think uh, this kind of terrorism, while it is unjust and inexcusable, is a predictable result of state injustice. Now, it's fairly easy to see that if you don't have states engaging in this kind of injustice, uh, you're not going to provoke terrorist responses against those states. If there's no state to pressure, then it doesn't make any sense for terrorists to attack the uh, ordinary people who live in particular territories. There's no, there's no state responsible to those people that will want to protect them by uh, acceding to the terrorist demands. Now, governments uh, obviously may attack the territories putatively belonging to other governments. Uh, again, when the governments being attacked are seen to misbehave in one way or another. But again, without national governments to do this, 
um, other governments, like terrorists, are going to lack reasons that they now think they have to attack people in other societies. So the important thing to remember then is that invasion and assault by terrorists or by, by governments is very often the product of government misbehavior. That doesn't excuse attacks on non-combatants at all. It's just a causal claim. And so in the absence of governments to misbehave, uh, terrorist and invasive attacks by other governments uh, simply aren't going to, uh, to be issues in the way that they are now. Now, here's another, here's another point. Suppose we really are talking about Attila the Hun. We're talking about uh, uh, a state that simply wants to expand its empire and is just brutally invading a stateless society. We can imagine a situation in which uh, propaganda uh, is employed to convince people that things are awful, that humanitarian intervention is necessary, and that we've really got to invade this stateless society because only then can we protect the children. That's, it's, all, it's all about the children, as you know. Uh, so in any event, uh, Attila the Hun uh, goes to work to engage in an assault on a particular stateless society. It's important to recognize that Attila is going to confront uh, quite uh, uh, problematic uh, circumstances, uh, circumstances that are very different from those that confront an invader in, uh, uh, a society, in a global society made up of states. So a state has an apparatus of governance in place. So when there is a coup or an occupation, whoever the new ruler is can frequently just take over the top of that apparatus while leaving the rest in place. And this can make an attack or a coup relatively cost-effective, right? You just leave the rest of the structure in place, whether you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, the post office or uh, the police uh, station or anything else. Leave this in place. So this makes an attack or a coup relatively cost-effective. Orders flow down from the top as before. They, they have a new source. But the orders continue to be obeyed because there's this whole structure of people in place who just keep doing what they're told. But obviously, if there is no state apparatus to take over, then simply occupying a few buildings, uh, shooting or imprisoning a few people, isn't going to give a new ruler control over a state apparatus. There's no state, state apparatus to take over. So instead, to assert rulership over a given society or community, uh, in the way that we might imagine Attila the Hun wanting to do, new orders from the top won't be enough. Instead, people at all levels are going to have to be forced quite directly to obey. And obviously, that's costly in multiple ways. It provokes a lot of uh, resentment. It requires more people to do the forcing who have to themselves either be paid or forced and so forth. So the Tannehills plausibly suggest that if resources are available to fund defense against foreign aggression today, they would certainly be available without the state. And I think this is quite